Part 1. Exam Practice. Listening. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Centre for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre. Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost £15 a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laberton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to Friends of the Arts Centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great! Do you ever offer discounts to Friends of the Centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all. Though, obviously, we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So, we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the Arts Centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. 
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students about preparing a questionnaire as part of an essay assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. I've never written an essay of more than one thousand five hundred words before, Anne. Me neither, Mark, and it scares me. Ah, I wouldn't worry. We'll just have to pretend it's four essays of one thousand five hundred words and join them together. <laughs> It says here in the assignment notes Dr. Brightwell gave us that we're to write between five thousand and six thousand words on some aspect of students' attitudes, backed up by our own research, which we present in the form of tables, graphs, charts, or whatever, and supported by reference to the list of books she gave us. Oh, I didn't realise there had been so many social science books written about students. Oh yeah, there are a lot.、Mm. And the questionnaire? Yes,、um, we have to、um, prepare a questionnaire to gather our own data for the graphs, etc., and hand it in to Dr. Brightwell in draft form in、um, two weeks' time. Two weeks. That's what she said, and what it says here. She says that it's better to have it checked before we go on to collect the information and start the writing.、Mm, suppose she's right. We'd better get started then. But she didn't say how we were going to put the questionnaire together. Does it say anything in the notes? Ah,、uh, nope. It only says that we are limited to four sides of A4, and no more than fifty questions. Hmm.、Mm. If that's the case. It's not that bad. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. So, how are we going to do it? Well, first we need to know who we're aiming it at, then decide how many questions we're going to ask. I think we could have about forty questions maximum. I don't think there's any real need to go up to the fifty limit.、Mm. And I think we should keep the questions themselves very simple. <laughs> don't worry. In my case, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a mixture of question types, like. Multiple choice questions, yes, no, and agree, disagree, with boxes for people to tick.、Mm -hmm. If people are asked to write down anything, it's unlikely they will fill it in. So, are we going to give this questionnaire out to people to hand in, or are we going to just stop and ask them around the campus or on the street?、Mm, I don't really know. Did she say anything about this? Um. No, she didn't, and there is nothing in these notes she gave us either. I think we ought to give them out. Okay. Anyway, it won't affect the way we design the questionnaire. We're both doing it on different subjects, but there's nothing wrong with pooling our ideas about the mechanism of the questionnaire. No, none. What are you doing your project on? I've been thinking about doing something around the subject of、um, how aware students are of world affairs.
people think that we're all up to date, but I very much doubt it. Hmm. It would also be interesting to compare students in different years. And you? I'm doing something on health and sport, and whether students are more or less active since they came to university. Ah,、oh, sounds interesting. As the questionnaires can be anonymous, I'll fill in your first questionnaire for you. But I'm sure you won't be surprised by my answers. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think so. <laughs> I suggest we put together about twenty or twenty-five questions each, and then meet tomorrow or the day after and compare them.、Mm-hmm. Are you going to type yours up? Yeah. Then I can come round to your place and we can work on them. You've got a laptop, haven't you? Yes. And I've got some new design software, so we can play around with the layout. Brilliant. Are you any good at doing charts and things? I know how to do simple things on the computer, but we'll sort something out. Okay. I feel much better about all this now. It doesn't seem quite as bad as I first thought. No, don't worry. We'll get it done. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Excuse me, Doctor Owen. I oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question, and I was wondering if I could change my paper to investment in knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States. And then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average, I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals.、Mm-hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested, and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text, and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through. Is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department, 
and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock. It's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it and will just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on life at work, which is being given as part of a series of lectures on productivity and work practices. First, look at questions 31 to 35. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good afternoon. My name is Dr Charles Butt and I shall be giving you a series of lectures on productivity and work practices over the coming weeks. There will be ten lectures in the mornings as part of this course, and in addition, there will be three lectures in the evenings from six to eight, which will be given by outside speakers. I would like first to look at a recent report on life at work. The report shows that the average British worker takes less than half an hour for lunch, 27 minutes to be precise, and that sick leave is on the increase. The drop in the length of time spent on lunch was nine minutes when compared to last year, down from 36 minutes. According to the report, this is the first time that the average lunch break has fallen below half an hour. As regards sick leave, you can see that the average figure is 10 days per year. 
That's up by one day in 2002 compared to 2001. While physical illness was given as the most common reason for absence in the case of non-manual workers, stress was the most common cause of long-term absence. It's worth noting here that 9 out of 10 workers claim that stress is a problem in their organisation and that 8 out of 10 bosses are feeling more stressed than ever before. I would just like to say here that we will be looking at the stress in work and study at a later date. And we'll be looking particularly at ways of dealing with it in studying, particularly for exams. You can see from the calendar that Professor Appleyard will be giving a lecture on this topic the week after next. The report also says that just below 50% of workers claim that they were taking less time off for holidays than they were entitled to. I'm not sure that this will be believed by the employers. Previous surveys have suggested that about one-third of days that have been taken by workers as days off sick were regarded by bosses as not being the result of genuine illness. Some more hard data is required to corroborate both these claims. Before the speaker continues, look at questions 36 to 40. As you listen, answer questions 36 to 40. All this suggests that employers are driving their workers too hard. The effects of overworking mean that workers are now being stretched beyond their limits, both physically and mentally. This is borne out by the increase in sick leave. However, Looked at from the employer's point of view, the picture may not be the same. Employers say that workers protest too much, but bearing in mind the data about the number of bosses feeling much more stressed than before, we need to think about this carefully. It's interesting to note that productivity has gone up in many areas of industry. In 2001, the local car plant had one of the sharpest increases in average productivity, with the number of vehicles per employee rising by over 30% a year. A new assembly line came into operation at the beginning of 2002, affecting productivity, which increased to the 100 vehicles per worker mark by the end of the year. This is a stunning achievement for an industry which was not long ago considered to be collapsing. It would be interesting to do a survey of the work life at the plant. Those of you who have opted to do the project and reduce the number of essays you have to do may want to look into this. Please see me at the end of the lecture. Right, now, let us move on to something else which I think... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.